again my friends and welcome once more to the Invisible College and if you're new here congratulations you found a needle in a haystack you think of all the channels there are and all the thousands of videos there are on YouTube and somehow you found this one so well done I hope you'll enjoy it there's many others are on available for you to see um, this is esotericism at its most uh, esoteric I suppose you would say. Um, we cover a wide field of subjects but particularly em emphasis on the Western Christian esoteric tradition which is not what you think it is and we're going to go into some of that today. So anyway this lecture today is called The Destiny of the World. That's a challenging title if ever there was one isn't it? And we're going to begin. Uh, I want to talk a few words about the prophet Daniel. There's a figure in the Old Testament. Uh, he was one of the people who was taken away to Babylon by the Babylonians uh, at the, when they first came to Jerusalem in 605 BC. And he was one of the intelligent young men. They, they, they wanted to take off the cream, as it were, um, and train them in their own Babylonian ways. They wanted to educate them, teach them their own their language, Babylonian, and how to read in hier uh, in uh, cuneiform, which is the kind of language they used, and use them as kind of um, go-betweens between themselves and the the Jews. That they've already captured some. They're going to take a whole load more in due course. So Daniel was uh, given a sort of privileged position in court, but he refused to make much of it. He wouldn't eat the special food that was provided. He very much kept to his own traditions. He wouldn't worship their gods, for example. So he got a bit of a name for himself. And the time came when the king had had a... a disturbing dream and he called all his soothsayers and uh, his clairvoyants and his astrologers and the people who uh, examined the liver of a, of a cow or whatever to interpret his dreams for him and they all said yeah sure we can do that we can interpret your dream what is it and he said oh well, I'm not going to tell you <laughs> if you're so clever you find it for me um, you know that's your job, not mine. So they went away and they said, well, I'm sorry, sir, you know, without telling us your dream, how can we do anything? And he said, look, if you don't interpret my dream for me, I'm going to assume you're all charlatans and I'm going to have your heads cut off. So they went away and uh, really perplexed, what, they, what are we going to do? What are we going to do? Um, and then Daniel came along and he said, um, I can do it for you. I can find out what the king's dream was and interpret it for him. So everybody would say, well, go, go ahead. <laughs> so he, he came to the king's attention, and he, then he said, I, I'll interpret your dream, but let me sleep on it first, and I'll come back to you. And the king said, right, you do that. So he, he went away, and he prayed to God, and he said, please send me the dream the king had. Let me see it, and I'll interpret it for him. And sure enough, he had a dream. And that's what we're going to talk about first here today. Now, the king's dream, turned out, was of a big statue. It had a head of gold, um, a sort of upper body with arms of silver, and a sort of hips and thighs of bronze. And then it had iron legs... And then it had uh, feet made of iron mixed with clay. And he interpreted this dream to the king. He said, look, this is a dream about um, a succession of empires. Uh, your empire, the, ba the Babylonian empire that you, which you rule, that's like the golden head. And uh, after that will come a second empire, which will be... Um, not not as uh, refined, perhaps, as, as your empire, uh, silver as opposed to gold. 
um, but they will be very powerful and they will take over. And after them will come another empire, an empire of bronze. And then after that there will be a fierce, terrible empire, the strongest of all, which will be like the legs of iron. And then below that, that will s split up into a bunch of empires that, which will represent, uh, or kingdoms which will re represent the um, ankles and feet and toes of the statue. So the, the king was uh, amazed by this and he said, yeah, I did have this dream, it's quite right. Um, and so he promoted Daniel and, and uh, things went on from there. Now then, I want to take you now to something else. This whole idea of succession of empires, um, what you're starting with, with the golden head, is you're starting with the most precious metal, but it's not all that strong. It's not as strong as uh, silver, for example. Um, gold is a very soft, malleable metal. You can hammer it out into sheets. You can draw it into wires. It's very malleable. And it's, it's, um, it won't corrode. You can bury something made of gold and dig it up thousands of years later and it's still there, bright and shiny, <laughs> hasn't corroded. And you can see that. If you go to the British Museum, I was there a couple of weeks ago, and you can see all these gold objects that, which have been found buried, some of them going back to you know, the age of Stonehenge and before. So gold has this quality of purity that it doesn't rot, it doesn't corrode, but at the same time it's not as strong as other metals. Silver is stronger, but silver does tarnish. It's, it, it preserves, it doesn't tarnish too easily, or it can tarnish, but it doesn't rot away that easily. So if you find things of silver, chances are they'll be quite well preserved, at least for quite a long time, um, but it's not as, uh, as precious as gold. It's, it doesn't have that same quality. But you can polish it up really brightly. You can make mirrors of it um, that reflect everything. And it's a very good, good conductor of electricity, for example. So is gold, by the way. But then below the silver, you've got bronze. And bronze is a mixture of, of uh, tin and copper. And it has a sudden hardness to it. That's why they put the tin into the copper. It's harder than copper. It's much harder than... Uh, silver and gold. So it, it was considered very useful for making weapons, at least in the Bronze Age it was, and, and breastplates and helmets and things like this. And you can see these in museums today, uh, dug up from graves, found in temples, you know, buried away. Um, they've come down to us, at least some of them, and bronze spearheads and arrowheads and all that sort of thing. And the bronze period represented a, another um, stronger empires. The gold was the Babylonian Empire. I should say the silver <clears throat> represented the Medo-Persian Empire. That's why it has two arms, the, the two different um, nations coming together, the Medes and the Persians, and they had greater strength than the Babylonians. They overthrew Babylon and took it over. Well, the copper uh, or, or the bronze, I should say, represented the Greek empire of Alexander the Great. And as you know, Alexander the Great conquered um, the Persian Empire, which included the, the old Babylonian Empire. And he, he was much stronger. They, it was to, during the Bronze Age he did this. And they, they forced their way in. They drove their way through Persia and... Um, right up to the Indus River in India, and conquered this massive empire, including Egypt. He also conquered. Um, and uh, what's now Turkey, all of that was, was part of the Macedonian Empire. And that was a, an empire of bronze, much stronger than the gold and silver, but corruptible. It didn't last. And then you had the two legs of iron, well, that represented the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire, as you probably know, had two capitals, at least in this later period, um, Rome and Constantinople. 
so hence two legs and it was a, a very very strong powerful empire the biggest and most powerful in all the classical empires uh, you can you know if the Romans came along you may as well you know run away <laughs> the Roman legions come marching into your town or approaching your city um, put up the white flag because they don't give in and they had all sorts of weaponry and uh, and catapults and uh, you know all sorts of stuff that other people didn't have and they were very disciplined so that was the Roman Empire and then the iron mixed with clay was a prophecy for the future um, splitting up of the Roman Empire into different kingdoms and and so on now I've done a lot on this Daniel prophecy and other prophecies of Daniel I've got a series of three programs on these on these uh, this subject which you can find on YouTube. So I'm not going to go into this any further, other than to say that Daniel did make some very accurate prophecies, including prophesying when the, uh, <clears throat> the uh, captivity of Babylon was going to come to an end, prophecies from, for the fall of Babylon, um, which he gave before the Persians came, and then prophecies for the fall of the Persian Empire, Medo-Persian Empire, um, by Alexander the Great and prophecies for the Roman Empire which was long ahead um, he was making these prophecies in about five, 540s BC uh, long before the rise of the Roman Empire or even the Alexander's Empire so he made those prophecies he also made prophecies to do with um, the coming of the Messiah the suffering Messiah of Jesus um, at the time he came which was just before um, the uh, death of King Herod, he was born, I think in 7 BC. And his crucifixion, of course, would be in 29 AD. And I've got reasons for saying 29 AD and not 30, but you'll find that in my other lectures. So Daniel was one of the people who laid out prophecies for, for the future world, you know, in advance of his time. And people who look at the book of Daniel now, they say, well, you know, of course, this must have been written later after the event. It's someone pretending to be this guy, Daniel. You can't take that seriously. But they have found copies of Daniel, or at least parts of it, amongst the Dead Sea Scrolls. So anyway, that I'm going to turn on from that because I wanted to just introduce that as the idea of this cascade of different metals representing a, a kind of decadence and I'm going to take you here to Hesiod um, he delineates it uh, four ages of man Hesiod was a Greek poet and um, I'm going to read out a bit of his his work if I can find it here I might not read the whole thing because it's quite long but um Hesiod, he was one of the people like Homer, an early, early poet, and uh, he was much revered um, by the, uh, the Greeks. So there's a poem called Works and Days by Hesiod, a Greek poet. He lives in the 8th century BC, so that's the 700s BC. Right, I'll read this out here. First of all, the deathless gods who dwell on Olympus made a golden race of mortal men who lived in the time of Kronos, that's Saturn, when he was reigning in heaven. And they lived like gods, without sorrow of heart, remote and free from toil and grief. Miserable age rested not on them, but with legs and arms never failing, they made merry with feasting beyond the reach of all evils. When they died, it was as though they were overcome with sleep, and they had all good things. For the fruitful earth, unforced, bore them fruit abundantly and without stint. They dwelt in ease and peace upon their lands, with many good things, rich in flocks and loved by the blessed gods. But after earth had covered this generation, they are called pure spirits dwelling on the earth, and are kindly, delivering from harm and guardians of mortal men. 
For they roam everywhere over the earth, clothed in mist, and keep watch on judgments and cruel deeds, givers of, givers of wealth. For this royal right also they received. So th this seems like a kind of um, uh, a vision of the earth as a sort of Garden of Eden uh, before the fall. And I think that's how we should probably think of this and interpret it. That everything's easy. You prick the fruits and you don't have to work. Everything's given to you. And it's always nice weather. It's always pleasant. So they're living in the golden age. And then they who dwell on Olympus made a second generation, which was of silver and less noble by far. <clears throat> It was like the golden race, neither in body nor in spirit. A child was brought up at his good mother's side a hundred years with an utter simpleton. Playing childishly in his own home. But when they were full grown and were come to the full measure of their prime, they lived only a little time in sorrow because of their foolishness, for they could not keep from shining and from wronging one another. So, sorry, I'll say that again. For they could not keep from sinning and from wronging one another, nor would they serve the immortals, nor sacrifice on the holy altars of the blessed ones, as it is right for men to do wherever they dwell. Then Zeus, that's Jupiter, the son of Kronos, was angry and put them away, because they would not give honour to the blessed gods who live on Olympus. But when earth had covered this generation also, they are called blessed spirits of the underworld by men. And, though they are of second order, yet honour attends them also. Zeus, the father, made a third generation of mortal men, a brazen race sprung from ash trees, and it was in no way equal to the Silver Age, but was terrible and strong. They loved the lamentable works of Ares, is Mars, and deeds of violence. They ate no bread, but were hard of heart, like adamant, fearful men. Great was their strength, and unconquerable the arms which grew from their shoulders on their strong limbs. Their armour was of bronze, and their houses of bronze, and of bronze were their implements. There was no black iron. These were destroyed by their own hands and passed to, the, passed to the dank house of chill Hades, and that's Pluto, and left no name, terrible though they were. Black death seized them, and they left the bright light of the sun. So, that was the silver and gold ages. I'm not going to carry on because it gets quite long. But I want you to see here something, and this is the idea of the age as a man um, which has come down to us from not just Hesiod but also Ovid and other people. So we have here a diagram which kind of shows a progress of ages uh, that goes down. So you start off with the golden age, everything's lovely, it's you know paradise, paradise on earth and then you get the silver age which you know, it starts off not too bad, but it, it gradually corrupts. And then you get the Bronze Age, and it comes tumbling down here um, into warfare. And then you have an Iron Age, which is coming down and down and down and through today. So we have this sense of the fall of man, the fall of Adam. And I want you to understand something, that... The idea of Adam, Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, I don't think this is meant to be taken seriously as, you know, these are the divine parents, the, the original, you know, God came down and he got his hands in the mud and he made this man and a woman, so it took a rib out of the man and made a woman and then put them in a garden, you know, go, don't eat everything but not that tree there, that, that's a bad tree, it's poisonous and it'll kill you. Don't touch that. Uh, this is a, a creation myth. It is a, um, a projection on the past uh, in terms that we can understand. Yeah, we understand about fathers and mothers. We understand about 
you know, you tell the children not to eat certain things when they go out. You know, don't pick, you can pick the strawberries if you like, and you can pick the raspberries, but avoid that. That's deadly nightshade. It'll kill you if you eat it. Don't eat poisonous mushrooms. You know, don't touch any of those toadstools you see growing in the garden. They're poisonous. Um, that's what a good parent does with their kids if they've got a garden. They instruct them what you can touch and what you mustn't. So that's kind of how I think the mythology of the fall of man is couched in the beginning of the book of Genesis. It's, it's, it's not written intending us to take it as literally, you know, one man, one woman, and everyone who comes from that. It's meant to be more that Adam represents man, man as a whole, mankind, our type. So you can see that in the Adam and Eve story, it's, it's not really meant to be taken literally, I don't believe. Uh, similarly, they have two sons, don't they? Cain and Abel. And the sons, um, you know, to offer gifts up to the gods, kind of make sacrifices. And Abel is a shepherd and he sacrifices a, a lamb and, the, the, and the, the burns it in a burnt offering and the smoke goes up to the nostrils of God and he's pleased with it. Thank you, good, good man, Abel. And Cain is a farmer who grows grains, crops, and he offers up a sacrifice of his crops. But, you know, probably when you put that on a bonfire, it's going to smell like burnt toast or something. And God doesn't like that and he rejects the offering. So Cain gets very angry and he goes and murders his brother. Now, this is talking, I believe, about the succession of development of mankind after the Garden of Eden uh, situation. In the Garden of Eden, all, you just go around picking fruits off the trees, don't you? A hunter-gatherer type living. Um, when you're being, you know, the next stage is you're domesticating animals, sheep, for example, or cows, and you're living off them, living off the mutton, living off the milk, whatever, chickens, eggs, and so on. That, that, that's, uh, you know, one kind of farming. Then you get the Neolithic revolution, as they call it, in archaeology, when they start growing wheat and growing emma or whatever, and developing these crops that they can make bread and eat that instead of having to eat um, meat all the time. So, that, again... There's, there's a clash between those two. The first one, he's now taking animals and, and, and uh, keeping them captive so they can be killed at will. Now you could say, well, that's not very nice, is it? Compared with the golden age when you're just picking fruit. Um, but then the, the next guy, he's actually cultivating the whole land. Um, you know, Cain and... That brings about further difficulties, and you get Seth, who's going to be the one who's going to displace Cain. Cain and Abel are both gone now. You've got Seth. Um, he's going to take over. So that's giving you another kind of version of the same idea of the succeeding ages and the kind of decadence that comes with them moving away further and further from natural law, natural living in harmony, with the planet and with everything that's on it. And, you know, in this, the four ages, you go through the Bronze Age and you come to the Iron Age, the, the kind of Roman Empire Age. But we're still in that. We're developing more and more weapons of war and much deadlier ones. So we, we watch this uh, ongoing war in Ukraine, for example, and it's horrible to see, you know, the, the sheer cruelty of it, of bombing each other's, well, you know, more the Russians, bombing the Ukrainian cities. And, and the, the, uh, the fighting on the front line with the destroying tanks by using drones, and uh, it, it, it's just a, a horror show. And you, that's all part and parcel of this Iron Age that we're living in. And it threatens the whole world. It threatens all of us. It could easily spiral out of control and turn into a nuclear war with both sides throwing you know, bombs at each other that could destroy everything. 
So this is the kind of vision of the world that they had in the ancient times of steady uh, decadence. Yes, people are getting stronger and tougher and their weapons are getting more and more powerful, but at the same time, they're more dangerous and more damaging. Now, I want to contrast that with um, another view, which is what you might call the archaeological view. And you'll see that expressed this way, <laughs> rather different. Um, so they see the hunters, you know, and at the beginning there, and the early farmers, that would be the, the Cain of a and Abel, um, you know, the beginning. Before that is uh, uh, j just sort of primitive man, caveman, living, uh, you know, doing a little bit of hunting and picking berries and digging out the odd root. And they've got a few skeletons and, uh, you know, usually not complete skeletons, maybe even just a tooth or two, uh, to tell us what was going on before that. And they work out a whole progress of um, succeeding generations. And they see it very much as a progress, a progression of getting better and better. So they go from the primitive hunters and the early farmers to the old Stone Age, they call it. And that's a Paleolithic, to give it its proper term. And then they move from that into the Neolithic, when they're doing things like building Stonehenge um, and building pyramids and, and uh, doing a lot of stuff with stone, but, you know, that they hadn't yet discovered how to use metals or not very many of them. And then it goes into the Bronze Age. Yeah, well, the Bronze Age, uh, the, the Mycenaeans and people like that, uh, they're in the Bronze Age. And then you get the Iron Age, which the Roman Empire is very much in the Iron Age. You have Iron Age Britain, don't you? And so that's a recognisable stage. And then goes on and upwards to today, and we're off the chart. Um, you know, we're, we've got wonderful things happening. We've got Elon Musk building gigantic spaceships that are going to take us to Mars. Uh, he, he, I love Elon Musk. I, I, I'm fascinated by what he's doing. But at the same time, I do have reservations. Um, his, his vision is that we can't trust that our civilization will survive on Earth uh, as a one planet civilization is it's very fragile you know it could turn out with a big nuclear war we wipe everything out or there could be a big asteroid that collides with the earth and wipe us out like the dinosaurs or something awful could happen so he sees a vision that to preserve the human race to preserve everything we need to to have a sort of a Noah's Ark situation we need to go to Mars and build at least one city there of a million people, self-sufficient. We've got to learn how to be self-sufficient on Mars to make everything that's needed, to grow everything that's needed in terms of food, to extract water from underground, assuming it's there, um, to make uh, you know, fuel or oxygen for us to breathe, uh, everything we need. We have to do it all. You know, it's got to be totally self-sufficient. And that way, if something happens to Earth, we got a backup plan, and he also sees this as the first stepping stone out to colonizing a lot more of the solar system. Uh, some of the asteroids, like Ceres, for example, quite a big one, or going beyond the asteroids to Jupiter and the moons of Jupiter. You couldn't go on Jupiter itself, um, Yasius Giant, but you could go on to some of the moons, maybe, and, and start something there and the same with Saturn. Um, Saturn's got moons and even abundance of ice there. Did you know that the rings of Saturn are made of ice? Yeah, it's interesting, isn't it? So there's an abundance of water in the Saturn system. So th th he sees that, and then eventually, you know, long after we're all past, um, mankind could even set about going to the stars and. It's spreading our civilization, sci-fi-like, out into the cosmos, out to Proxima Centauri first, I suppose, and then going out beyond it to colonize 
the rest of the Milky Way and go out into other galaxies and so on. So that's one vision of the future, and it's what you might call the progressive vision. But it doesn't take into account who we really are. You know, do we really need to be casting our bodies around with us to go out into the solar system? I don't think so. <laughs> you know, you're not your body. And this is the problem. And it's come out, this, this whole idea has come out of what you might call the new atheism. That all we are is animals. We're slightly more clever animals than the, uh, you know, the, the other animals, but we're just mammals. That the, you know, that's all that needs to be said. Um, and if we can manage to progress our civilization and go out to the stars, well, we've done a good job. But there's the other view, which is the religious view, you could say, or the enlightened, truly enlightened view. And it's not just Christianity that sees it this way. Other religions do as well, and, and philosophies, that our body is the vehicle for us. The, the, I'd like to put it this way, that your body is your horse, and you are not your horse, you ride your horse. So the real you is your soul, the, the invisible part of yourself, which is actually you. It's the you that looks out through those eyes. It's the you that gives direction to what you do. It's the you that uh, comes up with plans and, and uh, uh, has uh, wishes and dreams and, and uh, challenges to take on. Above all, it's the seat of will. So you have your will and your body is just the shell in which you live. It's your horse, as I said. So when you die... Does the, does the real you die? Well, there's plenty of evidence to suggest it doesn't. And that uh, the real you, your soul, leaves the body and maybe goes to another body, has a new incarnation. Or, if it's made a certain grade, can actually leave this system altogether and move on to higher hierarchies, um, perhaps becoming like an angel. So, this is the other view it's a very different one from the Elon Musk view. Much as I am fascinated by these rockets, I hope you can get a rocket to Mars. I, I think it'd be uh, quite an event, wouldn't it? I grew up in the time when uh, the, the people were going to the moon. I, I actually remember the first Sputnik. The, the Russians launched the first satellite called Sputnik, and it just sent out bleep, 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 bleep. And the Western world went crazy. How come they've done this, this incredible achievement of putting this thing up into space and it goes around the Earth and you can pick up these bleeps that send these signals back. Whoa, we're way behind. And that pushed the Americans into to developing their own um, rocket program and eventually they got to walking on the moon. At least I believe they did. I know a lot of people don't anymore, but I, I'm of an age to remember all the excitement at the time and I can't believe if it was all being faked, that it could have been kept secret from all those people who were working on the programme, and not one of them opening their mouth, I, I don't think that would happen. But, you know, I could be proved wrong, but I, I, I certainly believe at this time anyway that uh, they did go to the moon and they walked on the moon. Um, and I believe they will do that again before very long. And I, the excitement of that, the excitement of people landing on Mars, I think will be something comparable. Uh, but I have grave doubts whether, uh, with the best will in the world, they'll establish a city there, a uh, self-sufficient city. And knowing the human race, uh, even with the best will, you establish your city, there's going to be criminals. <laughs> there always are, aren't there? The people are going to fiddle things, they're going to do things wrong, they're going to steal from whatever was needed, that some very important system is going to crash as a result. Things will go wrong. Um, you can bet on it. So I have grave doubts about that. Um, but in the meantime, I do believe that we have another destiny, and I'm going to take you now to another diagram. And this is the 
7,000 year rescue plan, which is what the Bible and Christianity is really all about. Nobody ever tells you this. Um, <laughs> you have to dig deep to find out all this. But you can, you know, the, the, the people will tell you that, uh, that there was a bishop called Usher, Bishop Usher, who worked out the creation must have happened in 4004 BC. Well, and they say, well, of course, you know, the, the earth is billions of years old. Um, there's been all sorts of fish and dinosaurs and everything, all, all you know, masses of stuff happened. So this is laughable, his idea that the creation happened in 4004 BC. Well, that might be so, but what about the fall of man? I was talking about the fall of Adam before, and the sense of moving from the Garden of Eden stage the golden age into the silver age when did that happen well it seems that the beginning of our present arc of ascent in one view or descent the other view does it begin around then with the invention of writing and and the first mesopotamian cities city states um around that period so i would say that yes the fall of man actually around about 4,000 BC. Um, you know, the temptation of the stake of the some entity, which is called Satan in the Bible, or Lucifer, or whatever, a fallen angel, want to take over this planet. We don't understand things like that, do we? But we do understand that there are times when we do things that are against our best interests long term. But we do it anyway, we're tempted. Um, and that seems to relate to this idea of the fall of man. Um, and I've done a lot of other programs on this, what that fall was, the severing of a cord, of a connection that we had to the higher mind, to the energy systems of the universe. So we then have to eat food and, and uh, <laughs> we need to start becoming farmers. So that, that all goes past and past with that. But then we get... Uh, you know, between 4,000 and 3,000, and then 3,000 BC, we got Egypt coming up to its height. And that's a major stepping stone uh, in the development of civilization. And again, I've made programs about that. In the second, between 2,000 and 1,000, we get Abraham, he's around about 1900 BC and the start of the Kingdom of Israel, uh, which starts around about 1000 BC, but before that, they've been through all the Exodus business, um, uh, wandering in the desert, and you've got the judges, you know, Samson and all of that, and you end up with a kingdom, uh, that's Saul, and, 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 and around about 1000 BC. So then you get the Kingdom of Israel and Judah, kingdom of King David and Solomon and then the successive kings. The kingdom is split in two after Solomon. You have a northern kingdom called Israel and you have a southern kingdom called Judah and then the northern kingdom gets carried away um, by the Assyrians. Um, they disappear from history. Uh, so there's only the, the southern kingdom left, Judah, and a lot of them are carried away as well, but some remain, and, and then they become the Jews. They're taken to Babylon, they come back from Babylon. Uh, eventually they're taken over by the Romans, <laughs> oh, the Romans again, uh, and their country is incorporated into the Roman Empire, and they're kicked out, um, become wanderers among the nations. But around about... Zero, you know, between the BC and AD, we have the time of Jesus. And in the Christian tradition, he is the sacrificial lamb sent to the world to recover us. And that takes a lot of explaining to do why he would need to be nailed up on a cross and suffer that terrible death in order to buy us back. But it's all to do with oath taking. And he goes through that, and that establishes the early Christian era, which runs from 0 to 1000 AD. And then we get the 
second Christian era, 1000 to 2000, which you could call, um, you got the flourishing of Christianity in around about the, uh, between 1000 and 1200, 1300. It's really at its peak, uh, building of the great cathedrals, the, the sort of learning that comes about and the uh, development of the, the many different saints and so on in, in that period. Um, but it, it tails off as you approach 2000 uh, AD, which we, we've come past that now, but you move into the period of apostasy and people turn their back on the religious truths that had been understood and accepted by their parents and parents' parents and going back the generations. And they say, well, you know, we're just here, aren't we? And we've got science, and our science is we're learning new things every day, better medicine, better means of transport. We have all sorts of goodies. Uh, we don't need any God nonsense. So, you know, there isn't this big sky fairy up there you know, listening to your prayers and, and helping you. It's just emptiness. You know, there's a few stars out there. Some of them probably got planets, but they all seem to be dead. Uh, we got what we got. Uh, we better hang on to it. And we better go and build a colony on Mars, haven't we? Because if we don't, something might happen here and, you know, everything's lost. At least if we got a colony on Mars... Once think things have calmed down on Earth again, they can come back and rebuild it. Uh, so that's where we are now. Um, but it's not going to last that way. The, the prophecies in the Bible, particularly the prophecies of Daniel, the prophecies uh, of many of the other prophets as well, but also the book of Revelation, tell us how we're now in a very dangerous time. Um, we're in the, sort of what's called the end of days, end of time, um, between this period of apostasy and the return of Jesus for the full establishment of what he calls the kingdom of heaven on earth. In other words, this planet is going to be brought back um, forcefully uh, into alignment with what's required by the greater cosmos you know the cosmos is not dead it's full of intelligence and different levels of beings and god um and it has there is a certain purpose which we've abused we've done terrible things on this planet and it has to be put back put right and that's what's prophesied that he would come back here there's going to be time of wars and conflict and awful suffering and pestilence and a lot of people are going to die. But he's going to come back here and he's going to establish a thousand-year rule. They call it millennium. Um, and the king, he's going to establish the kingdom of heaven on earth, put things right, and then there'll be the final judgment, judgment on Satan for a start. Um, but also those who are still adhere to that way of doing things. And for some people, it would then be possible for them to leave the earth and go, you know, there's a whole galaxy after galaxy after galaxy, and all sorts of levels and experiences and everything out there waiting for us. Um, that will be the, for some, those who make the grade. Uh, and that's uh, another big question, isn't it? Um, or those who don't, um, well, it could be curtains, not just in the body, but the soul as well. So I think um, it needs to be spelled out that that is what the Christian view of the rescue plan is. Um, and it's a rescue plan that's been sent from outside. It's not come from, it's not our rescue plan. It's a rescue plan being sent from outside. Um, and we need to go along with it, I believe. So, if you're new, as I say, if you're new to this channel, this might all sound completely bonkers. I, you, you maybe haven't even got this far, if you think that. But for those who've been following what I have to say, you'll see how this is another piece of the jigsaw puzzle that fits in. And we have to start seeing the uh, 
times we live in and where we are at, and we're, we've come through 6,000 years of this plan, um, we're at that cusp just before the millennium, and then there'll be a thousand years, and then the final um, release. So I'm going to leave this with you, and I'd like you to think about that and have a look at um, uh, people like Hesiod and see what they have to say. And Ovid also talks about the ages. Um, and have another look at the book of Daniel. And if you like, as I say, I've got three programs on the book of Daniel. Watch those first. And they're, they're available there on YouTube. You have to just go to my channel and it might, they might even be shown there for you to click on straight away. Uh, or you can go to um, our website, the Invisible College website, which is called invisiblecollege.uk. Um, that's <laughs> invisiblecollege.uk. If you go there, you'll find menus for a lot of the programs that I've put up there. Not all of them, but a lot of them are there, including the Daniel ones. So I recommend you go and watch those. And then if you, you've got the stomach for it, there's something like 26 or 27 uh, separate programs on the book of Revelation, the Apocalypse of St. John. And as I say, the book of Daniel is the prequel to that. So that, all that material is there for you. And I would advise you to go and take a look at it. Uh, you know, we are living in very, very dangerous times. And it's not just about um, the wokeness that we see around us or the stupidity of it all. Um, or even the fact that there could be a nuclear war. Um, but we are living in dangerous times. At the end of the period of the 2,000 years break and the gap between that and the start of the millennium, the millennial rule. And it's a, a dangerous cusp point. But on the other hand, you could say you're very lucky to live at this time because it is such an exciting time, you know. But it's all down to us, isn't it? So take care and um, I hope we'll meet again. Bye-bye.